I would say, Bishop Murphy, you have now been ensnared by a, a snare of Satan and you should repent. You should repent. You should look to the Lord Jesus Christ and you should look to the word and you should repent. You should say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for not for not uh, displaying one, your glory for displaying your truth and misleading your people. The call of an elder is a high one. That's why the Bible says that not many should be teachers because they'll be judged at a greater, greater level than, than others. And so that's the reality. You're, we're called to be those who are holding the banner of truth, the word of God. Blessings and blessings to those who are watching uh, today. I hope this video finds you doing well and prospering in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to uh, look to him who is the only source of hope that we have both in this life and the next. To repent of your sins, to look to him for salvation. I want to respond to a video from Bishop William Murphy. I don't know if you know if he's a bishop. I guess it's Elder William Murphy. I, I don't really know. Uh, but there's a viral video that's been going around. Of course, if you're on TikTok, you can see all sorts of videos out there. And this one just kept popping up. And I saw it in different other places as well. And so I want to take a moment to just respond to some of the things and some of the claims that he's made in his video. Now, I would say this, I've, I've never done a video like this before, uh, so I don't know how, how long it, it's going to be. Uh, the video itself that I'm responding to is only about three and a half, four minutes, something like that. But it's him actually standing up in uh, the church that he pastors and he's talking about the uh, Roe v. Wade uh, overturning and what it means. And many pastors did that this week and said some remarks about it. But it was the claims that he made in his um, short kind of sermon net that um, gave me some alarm. And I felt like going through that, going through his claims would be helpful to those who are uh, followers of Christ, those who are uh, wondering how do we think about these things. And my prayer is that going through these claims would maybe help clear some things up. And so just so you know, as you're watching, uh, I've typed out a lot of my thoughts because I wanted to make sure I clearly articulated what I was thinking and and really applying some scripture to it as well. So I'll be reading uh, some things, but hopefully we uh, this will be engaging for you as well. But I just want you to get a sense of why we should think rightly and why the scripture should be our guide and not uh, the culture that's around us. So I'm going to play the video for you so you can watch the video for yourself. And then I'm going to come back and I'm just going to talk through all the claims that he's made uh, in the video. So check it out, this video from William Murphy, and then I'll come back and talk about it. All right, our, our country is in a crisis. Y'all do know America's going to hell, right? But my conviction is America can't go to hell with me and my family living here. I know that's not politically correct. I'm not supposed to say that. And some people will say, well, Bishop, you're a man of God. Are you pro-abortion? I am pro-human and civil rights. It's my conviction that a man, because let's go here, okay? So let's all the guys, let's all, let's all set appointments to get vasectomies. Or better yet, they not shutting the vasectomy clinics down. I don't hear nobody saying nothing. Look, I didn't see one protester outside of a vasectomy clinic. I didn't see one. But, but we want to legislate. We, li listen, we cannot legislate morality. That's, that's why the church is in existence. That's why there's a separation of church and state. That, that, that's why the church, the church legislates morality. The government legislates the law of God. All right? And so women have rights too. I don't have a right to tell you that, and somebody said, well, some uh, super religious person who got a bunch of sin in their life said, well, abstinence is the answer. Well, you didn't abstain. 
And what kills me is people out there protesting already have one. You had one in your younger years. And then don't tell me you're, you're protecting the unborn. Because if you're really pro-life, you wouldn't be cutting back funding for schools. If you're pro-life, you wouldn't be fighting for 18-year-olds to buy machine guns. If you're really pro-life, why are you fighting for somebody who's not in law enforcement, somebody who's not in the military, to have a legal right, a constitutional right, to purchase a clip that holds 100 bullets. But you're pro-life? Because I ain't seen a deer shoot back yet. Matter of fact, when I drove up in my driveway the other day and the deer saw me coming, he, he ran, ran for his life. He didn't pull out no Glock and start shooting. So I didn't need to protect myself against a deer. This ain't about hunting. This is about, and listen to me, once the door is open, don't y'all, don't y'all, see, this is why y'all got to wake up and stop being so spiritual and so heavenly bound that you're no earthly good. This is not just about reproductive rights. This is about voting rights. It's about civil rights. It's about human rights. Now listen. My position is that the Bible is still right. Look at somebody say, the Bible is still right. So when it comes to these issues, I don't have an opinion. When it comes to these issues, I do not have an opinion. If you ask me what I think about an issue, I'm going to find a scripture and I'm going to read that scripture. Because I don't have an opinion, I have a conviction that the word of God is still true. Somebody write that down. The word of God is still true. So it, I, I don't have to believe in same-sex marriage. I don't have to believe in it. But what I do believe is I don't have a right to tell you who you can and cannot marry. Look at somebody tell them, mind your own business. No, 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 you know, because church folk want to, y'all kill me because y'all some of the most nasty, freakiest, sex havingest, illegal sex havingest folk I know and want to make this about righteousness. That's why people not joining church because they know how fake we are. We're going to be real about it. This is not about righteousness. This is about civil and human rights. Because if the precedent is the Constitution doesn't talk about abortion, well, the Constitution also says I'm three-fifths of a human being. The Constitution also says that I don't have a right to vote. So if the precedent is if the Constitution doesn't address it, I don't have a right to it. I'm telling y'all, this is an open door. First, reproductive rights, then voting rights, then civil rights, then human rights. This, this is just the beginning of a demonic agenda, and the church has to get in the gap. Okay, so you saw the video and you saw the claims that he's made. Hopefully that you could see even already some of the, um, you know, faulty logic that he does and some of the skirting around the issue as it, as it is uh, before his people. This is a very hot button issue. This has always been one of those hot button issues. But for Christians, it should be very cut and dry because of what the scripture teaches about the Imago Day that every person is made in the image and likeness of God and every person has dignity, value and worth. And that is something that we as Christians have stood on for 2000 plus years. This is why Christians were persecuted in the first century a lot of times because they cared for the broken. They cared for babies that were tossed in the street. They cared. And even when we look in the Didache, which is one of the uh, one of uh, an early uh, Christian texts uh, from a Christian community, uh, the, the writings are, are really uh, the teachings 
for a community of believers, it taught that Christians should not commit infanticide. Christians should not murder babies, right? Because we value life. We see life and we value life. And so life it begins at conception. Life in the womb has value and dignity and worth. That is a human being in a mother's womb. We're going to talk through those things and we're going to talk through it with compassion and love, but we want to be truthful. We want to be uh, very honest uh, and critique those things that are, don't line up with the word of God. Well, here's the first claim that he made. He said, America is going to hell, but it won't go to hell with me and my family in it. So I'm not sure what he means by this. I mean, I would have to, you know, ask him personally. And for those of you wondering like, well, man, did you talk to Bishop? Did you talk to, you know, Elder William Murphy? I mean, people like this, they don't talk to people like me at all and don't receive correction at all from anybody because they are the man of God, as people say. You know, they they are so high up that they're, they're not listening to anybody and they have the anointing, quote unquote. And so, um, you know, they're they're above those things. But the scripture is clear that none of us is above correction at all. None of us is above correction because we're all being worked on by the Holy Spirit. We're all in fellowship with one another. And so none of us is above that. But he says, you know, look, uh, you know, America's going to hell, but it won't go to hell with me and my family in it. And so, again, I'm not sure what he means by that, but, um, you know, let's deal with it first. We as Christians have been called by Jesus to go into the world and make disciples. And according to Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we're called to go out and teach and make disciples, teaching them to obey the commands of Christ until Jesus comes back. This is what we've been called to do. But we also were called to be salt and light, right? Jesus even talks about this, that, you know, salt that loses its savior is, is, is useless. And so we're called to be salt and light in this world. We have a function and a purpose in this world. We have a function and a purpose in our communities, and that is to be salt and light. That is to be, uh, you know, those who are kingdom citizens for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're called to go out and make disciples and proclaim Jesus and him crucified. Immora immorality is not just going to uh, cease because, you know, we're Christians and then, you know, we're, we're around. No, we live in a broken and fallen world uh, until Christ comes back. Uh, we're going to see brokenness around us. So with that being said, we're called to be witnesses of Christ. That's what we are here for. Also, many people in America are already on their way to hell if they don't repent of their sin and place their faith and trust in Christ. That's what we're called to do. Proclaim Christ and him crucified. I don't know why he makes this statement. It just sounds like it's super deep, but it's really not. Um, and people just clap. I think we're conditioned. I mean, we're conditioned a lot of times in church to clap for whatever. I mean, you know, somebody falls over a pew, we clap. Somebody sings a bad song, we clap. Somebody says something crazy, we clap. Uh, we just conditioned. And, and that's a sad reality that we're not listening to what people are saying in order to respond to what they're saying uh, and not just going along with the flow. Here's the second claim that he makes. He says, uh, claim two, I'm a bishop. I'm pro-human and civil rights. Now, this is an interesting claim. So he says he's pro-human and civil rights, which I'm assuming when he says civil rights here, he's referring to voting rights and civil rights and that thing. And again, remember his audience here. His audience looks just like him and just like me. And there's certain words that, yeah, you know, if you say people are going to, of course, agree with what person would say, hey, I'm against civil rights or what person would say I'm against human rights. Of course, most people, especially folks that look like me, would say yes, because we know the history that has come with not having civil rights. Now think about it. He's using this position in order to prime people to accept the logical fallacies he's going to say, and it's going to cause them not to really think about what he's saying. Yet, if he was truly pro-human and pro-civil rights, then this isn't, isn't this the position of one that lines up with the position of being anti-abortion? To say you're pro-human life, then you would therefore have to, have to admit that the child in a woman's womb is human, not just a fetus, not just, oh, I'm just going to call this a fetus and it's just a couple of cells. No, I mean, this is a human life. Does not the baby have a right to live and flourish? And as a bishop, right, or as an elder, right, as a, as, a, as a leader in the church, a pastor, 
Shouldn't you first go to the scripture and go to the scripture as one who is not a novice, but one who can actually rightly divide the word of truth? So it should be with anybody who is handling the word of God. You should be able to go to the scripture and give an argument for what you hold to and what you believe. So for a person like himself and a person like myself, the, the authority that we have only comes from the word of God. We come under that authority of the word of God, and that's what we teach and preach from. But you notice he doesn't do that at all. Notice he makes his claim. First, he says it, right? He says, and again, and I correct myself on this. Yes, he is a bishop because he does make that claim. He says, look, I'm a bishop, right? And he, why does he say this? To give him credibility, right? To give him credibility, right? He, he says this so that, hey, the people can say, man, if you're a bishop, then you must know what God is saying. You must know the word of God. And if you're saying you're a bishop, then all right, man, I'm going to listen to you because you're speaking the words of God. And so he does this to bolster himself up. But notice, he's trying to great, make this greater moral argument, which is him saying, I'm pro-human and pro-civil rights. So how can you say you're pro-human, but you're for abortions? Man, that's a great question. I think, I think he should answer that. Like, you know, if you're saying you're pro-human pro and pro-civil rights, then how can you say you're for abortions? How does that work? Isn't that uh, a kind of like, you know, a, a an oxymoron kind of thing happening there? See, it's a war with words here and words move people to believe that what he's saying is rooted in true biblical conviction. But he's really not saying anything. It's like he's just blowing smoke. I mean, he's he's like what the scripture talks about with false teachers. They're like clouds without water. They look like they have water in them, but they don't. They're empty. And he's just speaking empty phrases here. He's not making any sense. You're pro-human and pro-civil rights, but you're for abortion? No, that makes no sense. Here's the next one. Uh, claim three. Look, let's let all the guys then get vasectomies. Now, full stop pause. I'm not from New York or anything like that, but that's a straight up pause. First, Every man in there should have just get got up and walked out. In fact, if you watch the video, you see the two dudes behind him at first. They're like, yeah, praise God. Then they start looking like, whoa, why are you talking about getting vasectomies here? Right. Why would any man want to be led by a man who is even making these lines of arguments when he's talking about abortion? His argument actually falls flat. What he's trying to do is this. He's trying to make a logical connection with the whole my body, my choice thing with men getting vasectomy. So essentially what you're saying is we should sterilize men. Wait, last time I checked, seems like you had a whole movement of people back uh, during, you know, after slavery, Jim Crow and, and all, all those kind of things that wanted to sterilize men, black men, so that they could reproduce. Just my thoughts on it, but just that's what history teaches as well. First, though, thinking about this, getting back to his argument. What does it have to do with men being having vasectomies? What does that have to do with the argument about abortion being wrong and taking an innocent human life? Now, to his point, no one's talking about shutting down vasectomy clinics, right? I mean, well, you go to a urologist, you don't necessarily go to a vasectomy clinic, but like maybe those exist. I don't know, right? A man getting a vasectomy has nothing to do with the abortion debate. Well, one could say, well, doesn't it show that then men are taking responsibility? Well, why would we argue again for the sterilization of men? Second, no one is arguing men shouldn't be responsible for their child. In fact, I would make this argument. Let the child live so men can help actually care for the child. So his argument actually falls flat and does nothing to help his position. And why will we protest vasectomy clinics again? I, I don't know. This makes zero sense. Here's the point. The point is this, is that, yes, let the child be born so that men can take care of their, of their children. In fact, according to a CDC study, fathers' involvement in their children's lives have been shown to have a positive effect on children and their well-being in many areas of life. For example, on the increasing the chances of academic success, reducing the chances of delinquency and substance abuse. So here's the thing. A child that is born and the father is active in their life. Here's the thing. It leads them to a better quality of life. 
So it leads that child to have this greater chance at flourishing in life. No, we need to be actually encouraging. Yes. And then in this whole issue, it seems that men are always forgotten about. Men are always men always are forgotten about in this whole thing because men don't have rights in the courts. Men don't have rights to their children. It's all about the woman. But yet it is men and women who are affected by abortion as well. No, there's men who want to keep their child. But yet because of this ideology, the, the woman then gets all the say and the man has no say at all. No, we want to see children flourish and they can flourish with having fathers in their lives. So what we really need is a child to be protected so they can be born and so fathers can be involved in their lives. This is what we want to see. And fathers are involved in their children's lives. So why wouldn't you want to see a child born so that they can experience a father a father's involvement in their life, whether it be the actual father, whether it be a grandparent, whether it be an uncle, whether it be some type of man involved in their life so that that child can do well. Here's the next claim he makes. He says, we cannot legislate morality. Oh, how many times you hear that all the time? People just say that, right? They just say stuff. We can't legislate morality. Well, let's look at this claim. What I think he's tried to say People's hearts won't change just because a law is in place. Okay, I'll give you that, right? And I'm being generous here. I'll give you that. Okay, people's hearts don't change because a law is in place. I'll give you that and I'll be generous on that. However, think of this. Murder is wrong and it's, it's, it's immoral to murder. So we have laws in place right now that actually forbid and make it illegal and immoral behavior, murder. So someone who rises up in their heart to murder, they know the law, right? If they move forward in this action, guess what? The law will come down on them. So guess what? Their behavior is modified. Someone may say, man, I'm going to go and kill this person, but yet they know the law and they know if they murder this person, guess what? They're going to go against the law and guess what? They, their behavior is all of a sudden modified. The racist heart, their heart may not change, but the law is in place to, to make sure their behavior conforms to what is right. Now, I saw this from my brother, Paul Favors. He said this. He said, we cannot legislate morality. The government legislates the law of God, which is what this what William Murphy said. But isn't the law of God moral? Right. Isn't the law of God moral in itself? And many of the very laws we have, even in our own constitution, are based on the moral transcendent God of the universe and his law. The scripture talks about this, how the law of God has been written on men's hearts, right? Men know it's, it's a sin to lie. Men know it's a sin, sin to steal. But according to Romans 1, men suppress the truth, right? They suppress the truth that they know it's there. If we're following the scripture, the prayer we're told to pray as believers in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 says this, First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be offered for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, so that we may lead tranquil and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you think about this as the righteous people of God, we want to see righteous laws prevail. Why? Because when we talk about a God who's a God of justice, we're talking about a God who is all about human flourishing, period. So, so when we talk about this God, we want to say we want to see laws that actually lead to human, human flourishing and laws that actually are right and just. So the righteousness of God, those who are his, they desire righteous laws and righteousness to prevail for one purpose, right? So that the gospel can advance, so that we can lead, lead quietable and peaceable lives, so that mankind can flourish, so fellow image bearers can flourish right here. This we want, we want godly governance. We want godly laws. So this argument really falls flat. But here's the next claim. He says, a sinful person can't make a moral statement or position because of their sin. Now, I want to read a scripture in 1 Timothy 
1, 15 and 16. So he makes this whole idea of, you know, and he uses this type of language. Well, you know, some of y'all out there, you know, you, you're picking in about, you know, uh, abortions, but you probably haven't had an abortion, right? So he's using this line of thinking and a lot of argumentation in order to shut down his opposition. But I want to follow and see if the scripture teaches that. And can we take that type of thinking and apply it to people's past or what they've done in, in, in relation to them speaking on that, which is true. So let's look at first Timothy one, 15 and 16. This is what it says. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hmm. Who's a sinner? Oh, seems like everyone, right? Everyone has sinned. Every single person, every single person have sinned, has sinned and fallen short of the perfect standard of God. Every person. And look what it goes on to say. It says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them. Now, but I receive, verse 16, mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now, think about who's saying this. This is the Apostle Paul. Think about Paul's background. Paul, before coming to faith in Christ, actually led in the murder and destruction of the, the of Christians. Uh, they, he fought against Jesus, right? He did all these horrible things. Now, could you imagine the Apostle Paul, who had this past, all of a sudden saying, well, you know, because I have this past, I can't talk about what God says or say what is right and what is true. I'm not going to say anything. Yet look at what he says. He says, look, I receive mercy for what reason? That's a great question. Why did he receive mercy? So the worst can experience the same grace he had. People go to prison all the time. And the first thing they say is, don't end up here. Don't do what I did to end up in this place. They may have done a heinous crime. And then they're in there and they're saying, look, don't come the way I did. Go another way. Find another way because this way is not it. See, this is a cop out that he's using. This is the cop out that uh, Bishop William Murphy is using, right? And people do this all the time. They use this cop out. They say, well, you know what? If you committed this sin or if you did this, then, you know, then you just, you know, you can't say anything. Or they use this whole, oh, they're, oh, they're super religious kind of people. These super religious people. That's the ones who talking about they don't want women to have abortions and stuff like this. But what in the world does this come from? So walking in holiness, speaking truth is now super religious. Now, think of this. What about someone in his audience who has had an abortion and has been forgiven? The pers this person uh, loves people enough to say, look, there's a better way. Hey, don't come the way I went. Don't do what I did. But look, go the right way. Go the better way so you can avoid this hurt and this pain that comes with the reality of having an abortion. What about the person who has had an abortion and is proclaiming, look, you can find forgiveness and hope in Jesus Christ. He removes a stain of sin and he removes the shame as well. Secondly, imagine a woman who felt like she was, wasn't strong enough to keep her child and yet she chose life because here's the thing. A lot of this argument towards women, it always kind of paints women as if they're, 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 they're completely helpless. Like, you know, you couldn't go through anything hard at all. And yes, we understand that having a baby is a very hard thing. I have four children. My wife and I have four children. And yes, it is very hard. But yet think about the woman who actually, instead of choosing abortion, chose life and said, you know what? Yes. Was it hard? Was it a struggle? But I'm, I'm making it. I'm moving forward by the grace of God. And so you can overcome as well. The, the, the woman who chose life and now she's raising her child and it doesn't come without struggle. That's the reality. Any, many things in life come with struggle, but we don't choose death every time we're going to face struggle. No. So the question would be this. Should that person be quiet? Should that person be quiet, Bishop Murphy, who is sitting in your congregation, who's possibly experienced that and now has found re redemption in Jesus Christ and their shame has been uh, uh, forgiven and their shame has been washed away and, and their sins have been separated as far as the east is from the west. Should they be quiet? 
No. Are they super religious because they're saying, hey, look, I want to live for Jesus and submit my need to him and whatever the king says, that's how I want to live. No, this is this line of thinking leads leads people away from really the true biblical Christ that says, you know, the, the true biblical Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and, and burn, I'll give you rest. The true biblical Jesus says, count the cost, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. If that's called being super quote unquote religious, then I don't know what you're talking about. No, that is biblical, normal Christianity. And so we want to encourage people to, yes, you may have a past, you may have things you've done before, but yet, guess what? Christ is victorious over all those things. And so you can point people to a better way. So he makes this argument, but I believe it does fall flat. And then he goes in deeper with this claim. So he makes another claim where he says, if you were truly pro-life, you wouldn't be cutting back funding for schools, fighting for bullets for guns and all these things. So we just have to make the assumption here that he's talking about Republicans or, or the politics of it all or or primarily maybe white evangelicals. Now, we could get into an argument over, you know, hey, what laws and what legislation and different things are, are in place and everything like that. But again, you know, this is not the argument that's being had here, of course. He's not the only one who makes the same argument. We hear it all the time. In fact, people like Jamal Bryant, he said the same claim. T.D. Jakes has made the same thing in the past, saying the same thing. Yeah, I, don't want, I want to point out what he's doing here. This is a straw man argument. And what's a straw man argument? Well, it attacks a different subject rather than a topic being discussed. And it's often a more extreme version of the counter argument. So the purpose of this is misdirection and it's to make their position look stronger than it actually is. See, think about it. The position he's taking is that a woman then has, you know, she, she, you know, women have, have still have a voice. Women need to choose, you know, that kind of thing. Choose what though? Choose what the argument he's making. He's trying to make an argument that a woman should be able to murder her baby in the womb. That's the argument that he's making. And we should not allow him or anyone else to escape from the actual argument at hand by using these straw man tactics and everything. Now, huge shout out to uh, my brother, Michael Griffin, and teaching my boys this fallacy, which I had to ask my 13 year old uh, uh, what this one was. But another fallacy here is the two quoque fallacy. It's, it's an appeal to hypocrisy that focuses on the hypocrisy of an opponent. Opponent. The two quoque fallacy deflects criticism away from oneself by accusing the other person of the same problem or something comparable. So the two quoque fallacy is an attempt to divert blame. So think about this. What does he what is him saying right about guns and, you know, health care and all this stuff have to do with the argument at hand? The argument at hand is this. Is it right for a person to murder a pre-born child? That's the argument. Guns, school funding, while they do have their place and we could talk about these things, they have nothing to do with this issue or the argument that needs to be made. Okay, Bishop, let's play your game. Let's play your game. So all these things, if all these things were funded, if all these things were, as you say, right, the, the funding, the guns, all this kind of stuff, if all this stuff was how you wanted it to be, would you then become pro-life? That's the question. I mean, would you then become pro-life? See, it's a bad argument to say that if one cares about the child in the womb, that somehow they don't care about the mother or the child's life after. The numbers of pregnancy resource centers, organizations, Christian clinics that show this reality that guess what? There's many people and, and, and most people I'm around care about the, the life of the mother and the child. Our church supports a, a pregnancy center that cares for the woman and the child all throughout pregnancy and after that. Sure, should there be laws and making sure there are things in place on the local level that and the state level that actually are leading to human flourishing? Yes. But again, no one's not making that argument. The, the thing we're talking about here, is it morally right for a, a mother or a father to murder their child in the womb? Well, no. So then he says this idea of 
the separation of church and state, the, that the church legislates the law of God and the government government legislates God's law. OK, I don't know what this is. There's a word jumble here, but let's just walk through it. OK, I want to talk about just a little bit. OK, and I'm going to read some stuff here on the separation of church and state. We see this a lot. I remember when I first became a Christian. Um, you know, I was, I was accused of this all the time. Oh, you just, you know, you don't understand the separation of church and state and you da blah, 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 whatever like that. And people say stuff all the time that, you know, you hear it enough, you believe it to be true. And so you're not like the Bereans to go search out for yourself to see if what they're saying is, is true. So you just take it as hand and this, it becomes talking points and talking points without facts are just empty words. We don't want to be like that. We want to be people who are substantiated in truth and facts in a culture that doesn't believe in truth. So let's look at this real quick. So the first clause in the Bill of Rights states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Now, the establishment establishment clause of the First Amendment is often interpreted to require a separation of church and state. So separation of church and state is a metaphor rooted in early American fears of government involvement. Now, Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island, was the first public official to use this metaphor. So he opined that an authentic Christian church will be possible only if there was a wall or hedge of separation between the wilderness of the world and the garden of the church. Williams believed that any government involvement in the church would corrupt the church. Amen. Amen. Any government involvement in the church would corrupt the church. Amen. Now, the most famous use of the metaphor of the separation of church and state was used by Thomas Jefferson, right? In his 1802 letter to the Danbury Baptist Association, in it, Jefferson declared that when the American people adopted the establishment clause, they built a wall of separation between the church and state. Remember what Roger Williams said, the garden of the church? He believed that any government involvement in the church would corrupt the church. Jefferson had early witnessed the turmoil of the American colonists as they struggled to combine the combined governance with religious expression. So some colonies experimented with religious freedom, while others strongly supported an established church. OK, both Jefferson and fellow Virginian James Madison felt that state support for a particular religion or for any religion was improper. They argued that compelling citizens to support through taxation of faith they did not follow violated their natural right to religious liberty. So as Baptists, and I'm a Baptist, I affirm the reality of religious liberty, right? And so this is what they were saying here, right? So these two were aided, right? And they fight for the dis disestablishment by Baptists, Presbyterians, Quakers, and others dissenting faiths of Anglican Virginia. So beginning in the late 18th century, two fundamental attitudes develop in matters related to the separation of church, church and state. All right. So now we're in the 18th century. The first, as implied in the Constitution of the United States, was supported by a tendency to leave the church set free from state supervision a maximum freedom in the realization of its spiritual, moral, and educational tasks. Now, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. All right. So the metaphor of a wall of separation of wall of separation was not intended to say that religion should not influence opinion on government issues. Rather, it was used to affirm free religious practice for citizens. The wall of separation is to keep the government from influencing our religious practice. Again, I'm going to read it again. This is from author Mia Nelson. The wall of separation is to keep the government from influencing our religious practice, not to keep our personal religious values separate from whom we vote for and what issues we stand for and against. So again, he makes this argument about this idea of the separation of church and state and all this kind of stuff. No, this is not even factual what he's saying. No, Christian, the reality is there's no actual governmental church, right? And we don't want the government influencing 
us are coming into the church, but the reality is that it's a vice versa. We're called as salt and light to go and influence the world around us to proclaim what the Lord says. And lest we forget our constitution, uh, lest we forget many of our laws come from God's holy laws. And so we see this, this reality played out in our culture around us. But then this is what the argument he makes based on that. He says, well, look, it's a slippery slope or this kind of doomsday scenario. So he says, you know, look, if if now they've come for, uh, you know, your your right. And again, remember, we're talking about the issue was when Roe v. Wade was overturned. The issue was this. Is it in the Constitution that a woman has the constitutional right to abort a child? And it is not. This is why I went to the states. This is the reality of the issue. So now it's a state issue. But he says, look, if they over if they overturn Roe v. Wade, then it's other stuff they're going to come for. So if you scare folks enough with something, they'll believe it to be true. Remember, it happens with white flight and black many black communities that happen well you know if black folks move in then our property values will go down and all this kind of stuff the worst case scenario is going to happen and then you know all this stuff is going to happen fear always leads people to act irrationally so he makes this claim uh, right he says well next is voting rights next is they they're coming for voting rights they if they took this out they're coming for voting rights now let's think about this the Constitution, as it was written, did not give a woman the constitutional right to have an abortion, which is why Roe v. Wade was overturned and now sent back to the states. Again, he makes this statement about how voting rights would be next. So the Voting Rights, rights Act of 1965 is a key component of the civil rights movement that's, that seeks to enforce the Constitution's guarantee of every American's right to vote under the 15th, 15th Amendment, the Voting Rights Act was designated to end discrimination against black Americans, particularly those in the South after the Civil War. So while our government has morally failed many times to live up to its high moral ideals, of course, you look at slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, all these things. But yet we see the Constitution in itself, right, being ratified to clearly state that those who are naturalized born citizens have the right to vote. Lastly, there is no push to repeal voting rights, right? We don't even see that happening. Yet again, the question comes up, how does this deal with the issue? Is it morally right to murder the unborn? Is it morally right to murder the unborn? Again, you're still not dealing. He's never dealt with the, 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 the question at hand. What is the unborn? And is it morally right to murder a child? Last, let me address this claim. Uh, Dr. Lena Wan in 2009 made a claim that this, she said that a thousand people died, that, no, thousands and thousands of people died before Roe v. Wade uh, because of uh, unsafe uh, abortions or because of, you know, the backroom kind of coat room kind of idea. Well, the Washington Post fact checked her claim and found this. It says estimates are fuzzy about deaths from abortion, even in the 1930s. They they, however, were about in the thousands, but dropped dramatically after a antibiotics were developed and continued to drop even more as as states loosen abortion restrictions. So in 1972, 1972, listen to this statistic from The Washington Post. Fewer than 100 women died from abortions. 39 were illegal. So that means that less than 100 women died then. So this whole doomsday scenario about, oh, man, look at how many women going to die. It's going to be thousands and thousands of women. It's not statistically true. It's not at all. Again, he keeps getting away from the point and we won't let him do it. What is the unborn? What is the unborn? That's the question that he never answered. He never said he never went to the scripture. He never opened up the Bible to really point people to what does God have to say about this issue? Well, then he says it. And what does he say? He says, well, I don't have a position or opinion. Fam, look at your shirt. Bishop Murphy, look at your shirt. 
Brother, like, did you not see your shirt? Your shirt was saying you had an opinion. What did your shirt, shirt say? It says that women have rights too. Essentially, he was doing, you know, uh, my body, my choice kind of thing, which is a horrible position for any Christian to take about their bodies when the scripture is very clear. Your, your life is not your own. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So wait, your life now is supposed to be surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, your body given over to him. So for a Christian and you as a pastor, to tell your tell women in the congregation that this is a, a, a mantra they want to stand on instead of pointing to the Christ, instead of pointing to the word. Is it any wonder why we have churches like this that are just run and run amok with probably sexual morality and all these kind of things because you have leaders like this who don't stand firm on the word of God? Well, you do have an opinion and you're wearing it. Yet here's the issue. You can't turn to the church like he did and say, well, turn to your neighbor and say the Bible's still right. Bro, you just contradicted yourself. But you just say you don't have an opinion, but you say, well, the Bible's still right. Well, are you supposed to, aren't you supposed to be a preacher of the Bible? Aren't you supposed to be one who actually proclaims what thus says the Lord from the word of God? He goes on to say, you know, the word of God is true, but I don't have to believe in same sex marriage. But I don't have the right to tell you who you can and can't marry. What? What are you saying? So you're saying in a room full of believers who are supposed to be believers that you can't proclaim what does God say about these issues? No, God actually tells us who we can and can't marry. Well, a man is supposed to marry a woman and a woman is supposed to marry a man. It's very plain and very clear in the scripture. It is no uh, uh, scapegoating around that if you teach and rightly teach the word of God. My question for you, Bishop Murphy, why preach the Bible? You might as well go ahead and be, become a motivational preacher, a, a motivational speaker, and just go ahead and close the Bible. Don't have it open. Get Please get rid of all crosses, all things and stuff like that, and just get up and just say whatever. Are well, you doing that anyway? Anyway, you just might as well make it actually formal. Say, you know what? Look, we're no longer going to teach the Bible here. We're going to just sing songs. We're going to sing and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And then we're going to talk about whatever. Well, let's look at what the Bible says about how you should have God's thoughts on these things. Well, John 14, 15 and 17. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. What's the role of the Holy Spirit? To be with you forever. Then listen to this. He is the spirit of truth. So you're saying God doesn't know on these things. You're saying you can't say what God says. And in fact, churches like his are so keen on the Holy Spirit as they're saying they're keen on the Holy Spirit. But yet, how can you be so keen on the Holy Spirit, but yet you won't preach truth? The reality is the Holy Spirit points us to truth. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because he does because it doesn't see him or know him. But you don't do know him because he remains with you and will will be in you. See, that's the thing. If you're saying you're spirit filled and you're saying you're following after the Lord and you're saying you're following after God, the Holy Spirit, if he's with you and in you, then shouldn't you proclaim what the spirit of truth says again, second Timothy two, 15, 16, be diligent to present yourselves to God as one approved at a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. This is not me saying this. This is what the Lord says. So whatever, here's the thing, Christian, you may have an opinion about something, but if your opinion is wrong and it doesn't line up with the word of God, then that opinion dies at the altar. That opinion dies under the authority of the scripture. That opinion dies and you say, Lord, what do you say? And that's what I want to proclaim. Here's the next thing. First Corinthians two, one through two. The apostle Paul says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I didn't come with brilliance of speech, wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, I don't know how much simple you can be. Lest we forget the job of a preacher. Second Timothy two, I mean, second Timothy four two, preach the word. 
Hmm, man, I wish we had some way to preach the word. Oh, we do. It's called the Bible. You open it up and you walk through it and you preach what the word says and you walk through it and you preach it expositionally. You say, this is what the Lord is saying to us because as the people of God gather, they don't gather to have a good time. They don't gather just to shout. They don't gather just to run up and down the pews and then, you know, throw money at the, at the preacher. No, they gather to say, I want to know what the king has to say. And and the high calling of an elder in the church is to proclaim rightly, this is what the king says. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Again, Bishop Murphy then goes on the ad hominem attack. And of course, when you don't have an argument, then you got to attack somebody and attack their character and talk about it and stuff like that. How do you serve the bride of Christ, but then talk about it like a dirty dog? What does church folk being nasty and freaky have anything to do with your argument? Nothing, nothing. Uh, Bro, you you must be talking about yourself because I'm neither freaky nor dusty nor nasty. And the people I hang around are not that either. The pastors I hang around, they're not that either. And so I don't know what folks you're talking about, but the Bible is very clear. Neither sexual moral, drunkards, uh, homosexual, adulterer will have their place in the kingdom of God. So maybe these folks you're talking about maybe aren't truly Christians in the first place. And if they're in your church like that, then that's why you need to be in the word of God declaring what God has to say about these issues so they know how to live rightly, not to not to earn salvation, but to live rightly because of their salvation, because they're born again. So here's the thing that he brings up this whole idea of look at these folks around you. They talking about these people want to have abortions and stuff like that. And they, you know, they all nasty and doing all this kind of stuff. No, that has nothing to do with the issue. People are not joining a church because, you know, he says, well, look, see, that's why people are not joining the church. This is why people are not coming to Jesus uh, because they they see all these, you know, people and they, their hypocrisy. The reality is people are not joining the church because they're not coming to Jesus. I don't know what else to say to you about that, but that's the reality. People are not coming and joining a church because they're not born again. Jesus said in John 10 that his sheep hear his voice and they respond. They don't listen to the voice of a stranger. Those who are his, when they hear that call, they come to him. So those who are coming to Jesus rightly are going to come because they want to be born again. They're not just joining a church. Here's the thing. The hypocrisy you're talking about existed in Corinth. It existed in the first century, second century, third century is going to exist until Jesus comes back. But yet notice the tr- those who are truly born again, they're they're saved despite the hypocrisy around them. But yet here's the thing. Hypocrisy in the church is not an indication that Jesus is not God, nor that he didn't rise again. Hypocrisy shows the reality and need for discipleship, but also it shows the need for a savior. Hypocrisy is even dealt with in the scripture. James 4, 8 through 10. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and weep. Turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. That could have been a great moment for you right there, Bishop, to say, look, for those of you who are living uh, anti-Bible and have anti-views of the Bible, then the Lord calls you to repent. So even your view of the unborn is anti-Bible and you should repent as well. But then he goes and makes this claim. He says, look, this is about civil and human rights. Again, remember language. He uses this language that people hear civil rights, human rights. Man, I know black folks should be in slavery and, and black folks didn't have the right to vote and all these kind of things. And he's just playing on people. He's playing on people's emotions. He's playing on people's uh, uh, heartstrings because look, the reality is who doesn't want civil and human rights? So his entire speech, it was a train wreck, you know, all the way, but the collision takes place Uh, really takes on a new meaning here. So he makes this argument about civil human rights, but for who? For who? So the baby inside the mother's womb is not human. This child has no right to life. See, you got to understand one size 
level uh, level of development, environment, dependency does not determine their value and worth. Man, a, a baby's size, if, if when they're when they're 12 weeks, right, they still have value, dignity, and worth. At the same moment, I have a five-year-old right now. They have the same inherent dignity and worth. Remember that acronym SLED, right? Size, level of development, environment, dependency. It does not determine your value and worth. Your value and worth is determined because you're made in the image and likeness of God. So then he uses this argument. He says, well, we're labeled, you know, no, he says, well, I'm labeled, you know, three-fifths a person in the Constitution, now, he makes a statement as if it's true now and he's playing on people's ignorance. And again, we're not we're not saying when we say ignorance is this a lack of understanding. All of us are ignorant on something until we go and learn it and go study. Right. So he's, he's he says, look, I'm labeled three fifths of a person in the Constitution. Now, while this language is still in the Constitution, you know, of course, according to, you know, you read a history about the three fifths compromise. Right. So the three fifths compromise was this. It was an agreement between delegates from the northern and southern states at, uh, at southern uh, United States uh, Constitutional Convention that took place in 1787 that three fifths of the slave population would be counted for determining direct taxation and representation in the House of Representatives. So this is why you have that three fifths language in the in the Constitution from 1787 from the uh, Constitutional Convention in 1787. Section two of the 14th Amendment in 1868 later superseded Article one, Section two, Clause three, and explicitly repealed the compromise. 1787, you have the Constitutional Convention where they have the three fifth compromise. All of, you know, think about it. 1787, you have the Civil War after all this time and then all this kind of stuff. 1868, it is then repealed. The compromise is repealed. So the 13th Amendment of 1865 effectively gutted the three-fifth compromise by outlawing the enslavement of black people. But when the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, it officially repealed the three-fifths compromise. Again, what does this have to do with the issue at hand? If anything, this, this whole point that he's, he makes here undercuts the argument he's actually making. The world system, think about this. Listen to what I'm about to say. The world system and those who follow this logic see the baby not even as three-fifths a person. Hear what I'm saying. They don't see the child as human at all. So slaveholders were more benevolent than the pro-abortion crowd. Man, that's heavy. So, so those who were slave owners, wicked slave owners, were more benevolent than the abortion crowd. Man, that is, that is, I know that's a strong statement to make. But see, they conflate the issue, and this is what Bishop Murphy is doing. They conflate the issue to escape them from talking about the actual issue at hand. He appeals to something in many African-Americans and that many African-Americans are passionate about. And yet he doesn't deal with the issue at hand. This one thing again, what is the unborn? So he uses phrases that gets everyone worked up and then he makes it seem like it's a civil rights issue. And this whole idea brings up again, look, he uses this language well, reproductive rights. Reproductive rights, right? It's just this term that was coined, right? And in like the the fifties or so, right? It says having it's, it's having the ability to decide whether and when to have children. Yet here's the question: Don't women have that freedom? See, the issue is not saying a person can't have sexual intercourse. It's not saying a person can't do those kind of things. No one's taking away uh, your choice to have sex, planning children, none of that. Yet abortion should not be used as birth control in the first place. Again, the question comes up, what is the unborn? Well, Francis Beckwith lays out this simple syllogism. He says this, the unborn entity from the moment of conception is a full fledged member of the human community. It is morally wrong to kill any member of that community. Every sex successful abortion kills an unborn entity, a full-fledged member of the human community. Therefore, every successful abortion is morally wrong. 
The most recent uh, stats from the CDC show that while African Americans make up 12% of the American population, they account for 28 to 36 percent of abortions. Now, Nancy Piercy, in her book, Love Thy Body, writes this. She said, if you favor abortion, you are implicitly saying that in the early stages of life, an unborn baby has so little value that it can be killed for any reason. In short, this view is an explicit agreement with a eugenicist such as Margaret Sanger, who desired to rid the world of the quote unquote feeble minded. Sanger wrote this. Every feeble minded girl or woman of the hereditary type, especially of the moron class, should be segregated during the reproductive period. Otherwise, she is almost certain to bear imbecile children who in turn are just as certain to breed other defectives. The feeble minded, quote unquote, she wrote and spoke of was none other than those who are poor, black and undesirable. Bishop Murphy makes the same claim. He, him, Jamal Bryant and different ones like him are, are just like the preachers Margaret Sanger went to in order to be used in order to get black people to abort their children. Jesse Jackson, go read about it. You can go Google it. Read Jesse Jackson's words on abortion before he ran for president. Jesse Jackson was truly pro-life and, and pro-life from womb to the tomb. But after money came rolling in and after political expediency came rolling in, Jesse Jackson flipped the script just like many politicians do. But we're called as Christians to stand firm on the word of God and not be moved by what the culture is doing. I don't care that right now me making these statements make me on the outside of a lot of different things and makes me in the minority. But Jesus said, look, don't be surprised when you're treated just as the master. And this is the thing. No one is being uh, harmful, abusive or anything like that. It's just that the truth is the truth. And we have to stand on what God says is true. Here's his final claim. He says, you know, we're too spiritual. But then he goes on to say we're in a spiritual battle. This is crazy. So he says, you know, wake up, you know, stop being so spiritual. You know, you you so heavily bound, but you know, earthly good. Wait, hold on. The Bible is clear in Colossians 3, 2. It says this. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. No. See, here's the thing. When you're heavenly minded, you are earthly good. When you're heavenly minded, you have the mind of Christ. You allow. Look, the scripture is clear. We take captive those thoughts that exalt themselves above Jesus Christ. When you have a worldview and you should have a biblical worldview, your lens, the lens that you look through things through is from the word of God. So you're looking the same. What does God say? That's what I want to walk in. What does the Lord say? And that's my view on things. So he uses this whole trope of like, oh, you know, you just being too spiritual. You're being super spiritual. Man, come on. We're, 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 we're supposed to be walking and following the leading of God, the Holy Spirit. We walk by faith, not by sight. So he ends up saying, and look at look how he contradicts himself. You're too spiritual. But then he says, this is a demonic agenda. What? Wait, hold on. So if people are too spiritual, but yet it's a spiritual battle we're facing. Which is it? Like, which is it? What are, what are you saying? The Bible is clear. We're called to be strengthened by the Lord, by his vast strength. We're called to put on the full armor of God so we can stand against the schemes of the devil. I would say, Bishop Murphy, you have now been ensnared by a, a snare of Satan and you should repent. You should repent. You should look to the Lord Jesus Christ and you should look to the word and you should repent. You should say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for not for not uh, displaying one, your glory for displaying your truth and misleading your people. The call of an elder is a high one. That's why the Bible says that not many should be teachers because they'll be judged at a greater, greater level than than others. And so that's the reality. You're, we're called to be those who are holding the banner of truth, the word of of God. It seems like the one who's aiding the demonic agenda is people like him. 
And I say that with all love and compassion. Not that I hate him. Not that I hate anyone like him. But it's, it's the reality. If you're wrong, then, then guess what? And, and you receive correction, then go back to the word and say, Lord, forgive me. There's, there's forgiveness there. There's grace there. Even for the person who has experienced abortion, there's, there's grace there. There's forgiveness there. There's mercy there. God loves you. That's why Christ died on the cross for you. But not just for the woman who is experiencing maybe the shame. And maybe you're experiencing that right now where you are. Christ forgives. He says, come to me with all your sin and all your burdens. I will give you rest. But even for the man who's paid for abortions, the man who's encouraged his wife to get abortions, look, you can repent as well. There's forgiveness and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can walk with him in new life. I pray this video was helpful to you. I know it's kind of long, and I know it's a lot to walk through, but I pray that you would give some consideration to some of the things we're saying. Some of the things we were walking through and to say, do you line up with the Lord? And if you don't, then go to the word and find what Jesus says and then walk that out and believe that we want to have orthodoxy and orthopraxy in our walk as believers. Be blessed. Talk to you soon.